The following is a digital media production. Find your voice. Hey, fantasy football fans. It's finally opening week of the NFL regular season. FanDuel's back with fantasy football for the everyday fan. New contests start every week. No more busted seasons. This year, there's an upgraded experience. You can try beginner contests for new players only. Settle a score with a friend in a head-to-head contest. Even play for a dollar. There are choices for every budget. Pick a contest, choose your team, watch your score in real time. Try FanDuel now and get up to $50 in free entries. New users who deposit will get five free entries to NFL 50-50 Beginner Contest, valued at up to $50. You'll get one free entry a week for five weeks. The value of free entries depends on deposited amounts. Go to FanDuel.com, click the Join Now button, and use my promo code MMQB. That's FanDuel.com, promo code MMQB, void where prohibited. Hello, I'm Peter King, and welcome to the MMQB Podcast with Peter King, where I take you inside the minds of the biggest influencers in the NFL. This week, John Elway, the architect of the Super Bowl champion Denver Broncos, joins me, as well as his division nemesis, Philip Rivers, a team in transition, the San Diego Chargers. So we'll talk about two AFC West foes, starting with Elway. I thought what was really interesting in our conversation was about how he learns about the players he wants to employ. Because I know what I liked and what I didn't like in different coaches, it's easy for me to evaluate coaches because I know what I liked. And I was fortunate to have great coaches, so I got exposed to so many different kinds of coaches, and so I knew what I liked. And so that helps me there. And from my conversation with Philip Rivers, a plea about keeping the San Diego Chargers in San Diego. 55 years Chargers have been here. I mean, I can't imagine uh, them only having one pro franchise in the Padres not having football here after 55 years. And So I certainly am biased and hopeful that uh, we'll stay here. Now, John Elway on the MMQB Podcast with Peter King. I am here in Denver with John Elway at the Denver Broncos training facility. John, really appreciate you joining me on the podcast. You bet. Good to be here. You know, on this podcast, one of the things we do is we just try to have conversations about how you got to be where you are today. And so I'm sure some people won't like it, but you might like it. We're not going to talk much about John Elway, the football player. I want to talk about how you got to this position in your life where there's only been three people in the history of American sports who have won a championship in their sport, who are in the Hall of Fame of their sport, and then built a championship team in their sport. It's Jerry West and Joe Dumars in the NBA and you in the NFL. So when I tell you that, does it surprise you at all, the small number of people? Because I always think the institutional knowledge you must have and you must have gained over the years. Why haven't more people used that? <clears throat> you know, it's a good question. I, I don't know why. I, but uh, it does surprise me a little bit, especially, I think, if you look at the history of even coaches. You know, you haven't had a lot of great players that have become great coaches. A lot of times to me, because I, I think about that, and I've always tried to figure out exactly why great players don't become great coaches, because I think a lot of times great players don't know how they do it. And I think they have a tough time explaining why they reacted in a certain way that they reacted. And so, um, you know, and maybe that's the same case for, you know, in the front office with an organization like I've been with the Broncos that, uh, you know, there are a lot of systems and a lot of organizational things that you have to do. But I think ultimately when it comes down to it, you're reacting and you're following your gut and trying to make the best decision of what you think's right. And, and uh, fortunately, I've got great people around me here in Denver that help me direct me that way. But ultimately, when we make decisions, it's got to feel good in the gut. And, uh, you know, so that's ultimately what we follow is, you know, we follow my gut. So, John, you – finish playing. Uh, it's early in 1999. You've decided that you're not going to play anymore. And you start to think about your future. And you've had a string of successful car dealers. And you're into that for a while. But 
around 2001, you feel like, and I'm putting words in your mouth, you sort of feel like there's something missing. What's missing in your life at that point? Well, Peter, when I retired, because I'd been in football my whole life, and so dad being a coach and every Saturday in the fall was always about a football game. And then, you know, then I played and then obviously in the NFL. And so for 16 years in the NFL and then, the you know, the 20 some years, 22 years I was alive, I'd always been around football. So I finally said, you know what, I'm going to take a couple years trying to figure out if there's something else out there. Now, I did get involved in the car business and I'd had some dealerships and, and uh, really had planned on that kind of being the next step because I got into the dealerships in 1989 and bought my first three in 1991. And so really kind of planned on doing that, and I enjoyed that. But what happened was in 1998, the same year I retired, AutoNation came in and offered me too much money for them, so I had to sell them, right? So it was a good situation, and the fact that the money was there, and, and that's kind of what I planned on doing. So I sold them. And so then, therefore, I'm, I'm out there saying, okay, now what am I going to do again? And I had it set up perfect until AutoNation came in and offered me the money. So I said, okay, I'm going to take two years to try to you know, figure out, you know, do I want to get away from football? What do I want to do? And so that's what I did. And then, as you said, and then 2000, and I, and I enjoyed that time. And uh, even though I had a non-compete with, I couldn't get back in the car business because of a non-compete. Um, and so I, I was out there and I enjoyed it and then decided, you know, 2001, I wanted to kind of explore the personnel side. I had not really been on it. I'd seen it. My dad had been the, you know, pro director here with the Broncos my last six years and he was still in it, and so and he was going to retire. And so I asked Mike Shannon if I could come in and sit through the draft process with him, kind of see how it worked. And uh, what were those three or four weeks like, where you sat in the draft room, you listened to the coaches talk, you listened to the scouts talk, you listened to your dad talk, you listened to Shanahan talk? What were those weeks like for you? You know, it was exciting because I'd never seen that side of it before. As a player, you never really see that side. You, you obviously you're in a bunch of meetings and your film study, but it's a different situation because I'd never been in, you know, hear coaches or scouts talk about players. And so, you know, I, it kind of excited me. And, uh, you know, I, I sat there and there were long days, but they went fast. And plus I got a chance to, you know, sit next to my dad, spend a lot of time with my dad. And, and uh, so, I, I mean, I really enjoyed it. We did it for I did it for a month. And then, uh, you know, the way things turned out, it was, you know, the last month of my dad's life, he died a week before we went into the draft. And so I didn't experience going through the draft because of that. But, uh, uh, you know, as it worked out, I was thankful that I did get to spend that much time with my dad, you know, the last month. Your father died, I think, April fifteenth, two 2001. And what I recall about that time <clears throat> is that I remember Mike Shanahan said this, I forget if it was that year or a few years later, that one of the greatest things that happened that he saw is that you and your father spent much of the last month of his life together, you know, the way you had been for so often in your life. So when you think back on it, as horrible it was to lose your dad, what was that month like for you? Well, I mean, that's the most time I'd ever got to spend with him. So, I mean, it was... You know, it was a tremendous month, and I, you know, and and going through it, I was kind of all ears, and and a lot of times I'm a, believe it or not, a pretty good listener because I I'm always like I can't learn if I'm talking. The only way I can learn is if I'm listening, because I know what I know, and so I like to listen. And so I mean, I sat there and I did do a lot of listening and and uh, different styles of different scouts and what they saw, and so and it was a very it was very much a crash course for me, even though I'd studied film my whole life. When I looked at film, I was always looking at coverage and I was looking at what defenses were doing and how we were going to beat defenses and those type of things rather than looking at individual players on the defense and evaluating those individual players. So it was very different for me. But I, it was a great learning. It was like going to you know business school or going to football school for a month and being able to be in the best class you can be in because you're right in the middle of everything. And and uh, it was a great experience, and and uh, and even like I said earlier, it was a great experience not knowing it at the time, but to be able to be able to spend that last time with my dad. So one of the things I know that you valued in that period of time is that you saw and you learned about what really was important in football players. I mean, and I know you f- always felt that one of the things that maybe is underrated in the scouting process is a player's competitive nature. And 
talk to me a little bit about maybe what you learned at that time. I know your dad. I remember your dad in that draft. He loved Drew Brees yeah. when everybody was a little bit down on Drew yeah, Brees because right. he was a little guy. Yeah, yeah. And that's what was amazing. And the thing is, I look back that month, and I so wish it hadn't ended just after that month because it really at that point in time now – in my opinion, was going to be able to sit down and really sit with my dad. We have, you know, that conversation to be able to just learn as much as I can from his experience. Because even though it was a month there, it was still a very short time when you're talking you about it. You had not it. drained I, him dry yet. I had not drained him dry. <laughs> I had big plans for him, too. I was going to wear him out and keep him busy. But, uh, um, you know, the one thing I do remember in that draft is, you know, Drew came out in that draft, and he was the one that stood out about Drew and had him ranked higher than every, anybody else. Your father obviously, did. As you said, yeah, my dad yeah. did. And obviously you said, you know, his size was not ideal and all the numbers are not, not ideal, which, you know, a lot of everybody looks at. But he had that ability to, to look at and talk about that competitive nature that you're talking about and that heart and how we played and how we – Made got things done on third down, stayed on the field, made plays in the right situation. May not have been flashy, but he was able to pick out the things that were very productive about Drew, what Drew did that made him higher on his list than anybody else's list. I wonder, if Drew Brees lasted in that draft, do you think that Mike Shanahan might have been interested in him later on, late second or third round, or... Was Mike a little prejudiced against the shorter guys? You know, I don't, it's a good question, but uh, you, you never know because Mike always held his cards pretty tight to the vest. Yeah. And so, I mean, with Jay know, Cutler, nobody knew until that day. Exactly. And yeah. so I think that uh, Mike had his sights on Jay. So uh, maybe he would have if that hadn't worked out, but it's hard to say. And, and I just, uh, you know, I know that <clears throat> Mike was very good at listening to and took a lot of advice, but uh, ultimately it came down to, you know, he was going to make that decision. So, you know, it had been interesting. I'm not sure if, you know, that would happen or not. What do you think, John, was the key to you sort of getting bit by the bug? Because you ended up running the Colorado Crush, you know, the arena team for several years, and you won championships. And I wonder, what was it about building teams that kind of now got you really interested in it? Well, I mean, I think as a competitor, you never lose that. You never lose being a competitor. I mean, that's built in, you know, and I think that, uh, you know, and I don't care what line of business you're in. To me, if you're going to, if you're a competitor and you like to compete, you're going to be successful. You're going to be more successful than, than not. And you're going to give yourself the best chance. And so, and I don't care what business you're in. I believe that that's what what makes people want to be good at what they do. And I did the crush. I would tell you this. I really enjoyed the crush. I really did. I knew, you know, when I... How many years? I was there for seven years. Wow. For seven years. And so, you know, and when I was here with Mike, and Mike had things going here too. And so, I mean, there was never going to be a... I didn't have big visions of going and leaving Denver and going and, you know, running another, another team at that point in time. I did want to get, lay the base, and that's why I did the arena team. And, and uh, you know, Mr. Bone was an owner as well as Stan Kroenke was also an owner. So to be able to be around those guys and... But also be the guy running the organization. And even though it's a much smaller size as far as the Arena Football League, everything everything else was pretty much the same. And how you work with people and how you find the right people and work together and put the right players together to be able to to win. And so and so as a player, not being able to play is still the greatest thing. But the next best thing is try to put guys together and give them opportunities to be successful. I know one thing that I, you know, that's why I look. You know, Mike came in when Mike came back as the head coach. I really felt like we had a chance because he was going to do everything we could to try to win. And we, we were kind of on the same page as far as talent, what he thought of talent, and, and how to, how to you know, win football games. And so I kind of wanted to be that guy to players too and still do. It's give them – because their windows are so short in the NFL that I want to be that guy that gives them the best opportunity to be successful, not only players but also coaches, and be able to put them and do the best thing I can – to give them the best opportunity to, to win a world championship because that's the ultimate. Now, obviously, the money is great and it gives you, you know, great security, but the thing that you always remember is winning that championship. So you want that, and I get that, but I wonder now when you look at your first half decade running the Denver Broncos, even though you want to put players in the best position – and you want to be that guy that the players say, hey, listen, he's doing everything he can for the team. You have had to make a few decisions that really have ticked off some players. And 
you said to me at one point a year ago, the one thing that you learned very early on is that you, although you have great affection for the players and you have great respect for the players, you do not want to be the players' friends because there's going to come a time where you're going to have to go to Peyton Manning and say, you've got to take a $4 million pay cut because 